thank you all right to uh come here so sarah um we're gonna have a fire chat uh 15 minutes of fire chat and then we can dedicate 15 minutes to the q a mm -hmm. um you gonna talk about why alien life may be weirder than you think right I, I maybe <laughs> maybe not sure okay i was given and, a title and i just thought i didn't disagree okay. with it so. okay okay great uh, and i think okay this is great actually because you gave also a ted talk right about mathematic yes. arts and information yes. right yes. okay if you can mix everything <laughs> perfect uh so yeah let's start um I have a first very general question, just just a start, right? So, yeah. uh, can you just say to us what are you working on and why does it matter? Sure. Um, I'm interested in understanding what life is. I think it matters because if we don't understand what life is, we'll never know if there's other life out there. I don't think that we'll ever detect the aliens unless we actually know what we're looking for, so we could debate that. Um, and also, it's critically important for solving the origin of life. Uh, which is a problem that I think has much broader scope than most people appreciate and probably touches most existential threats that we worry about, but also emerging technologies in, in all sorts of areas. Um, so I think if we solve that problem, the ramifications are actually quite broad. So I care about those two problems, really. Okay. And um, what is um, what can be a positive um, existential hope future out of your uh, oh. studies? Um, so I, I always think about life in terms of like longevity of life on Earth. So a lot of the concepts that we're developing, thinking about life, don't focus on the individual as the important thing. It really focuses on um, lineages of information. Um, or you might think about it as the process of complexification. So when I think about life, I don't think about life as a cell, as the fundamental unit. I think of the entire biosphere as a structure extended from over you know, 3.8 billion years of evolution so far as an example of life, which then has implications for what happens in that evolutionary process as life is learning about the environment from which it arose and the universe in which it lives. At some point, there's a transformation where you get things like us that start asking questions about what they are. And then when they have a deeper understanding of that, that expands the space of what's possible to happen on that planet. And so I think um, for me, this question is really important because it broadens the horizon of what's possible in the future if we solve this problem. Just in the same way that any deep fundamental understanding we've gained in humanity's past led to technology, you know, several centuries since. So I like to always give the example of like Newton discovering the laws of gravitation leading to us launching satellites today and these kind of things. So you wouldn't anticipate those things necessarily at the time, but I think when you get those deep fundamental laws, they really are transformative. Uh, and what about existential risk? Um, I'm, I'm so on the existential hope side. I have a blind spot for risk. <laughs> I can't like, I can't see risk at all. Um, I, I don't know how to think about that problem actually. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a problem for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I don't know how to think about it. And, and so let's come back to the existential hope, right? Yeah. Um, what, um, what would you, what can accelerate actually your research and, uh, and lead us throughout this existential hope future? Uh, we need larger experiments, Large. larger, <laughs> larger collaborations. What it, actually, so it's it's a little, um, uh, a little bit. Uh, more subtle than that. I think I think there's a few things. So looking at a problem like life and trying to understand how to solve that problem. Um, from my perspective, so I, I didn't give this as a preface, but I'm trained in theoretical physics. So I'm very romanticized by the idea of deep fundamental laws. Um, and the fact that, you know, our, our, our minds have the ability to understand those kind of things and regularities, I think is pretty profound. Um, so for me, the origin of life problem has been really hard because people are thinking about it in a really superficial, shallow way. They're really interested in making molecules that life on Earth produced under tightly controlled experimental conditions, assuming that those are modeling the prebiotic Earth. Um, and the problem with that is there's no knowledge of your own agency that you're putting into the experiment when you do this. So if you actually accept the fact that life you know, like everything in this room is built by life, um, including if we were doing an experiment in chemistry right now, it would be built by life too. And so it's a part of the lineage that emerged on early earth. There was an original life event and everything constructed since is actually causally contingent on that original life. 
there's one causal structure. And so when you do an experiment, it's actually a part of that. You can't remove life from the experiment. So what you have to do is try to minimize the conditions, the boundary conditions experiment, and try to remove as much of our influence on the experimental conditions as possible, or at least figure out how to control them. And so, um, and so that process um, is actually quite challenging. And so designing those kind of experiments is actually Lee's job, not my job. <laughs> um, but I, um, I'm really interested in trying to figure out what's the theory that you would test under those kind of conditions, um, and what would what would that tell us um, about solving the problem and how do we do that? So it's really, it's everything from uh, building a new theory of physics to explain what life is to building the technology to do the experiments and then also really trying to think about what would be the cultural conceptual shifts that need to happen in order for us to understand really at a fundamental level what life is. Um, and there's a lot of layers there. <laughs> and also I think like, I, I, I think, most people don't know how to think about this problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what, what's what's the most urgent actually part of this for you? Um, <clears throat> getting people to be open-minded enough to see that there's entirely different ways of solving problems that we just haven't seen and they're like literally right in front of our face. Yeah. If we just drop most of the dogma we have <laughs> and we just try to ask questions like from first principles and a little bit more like forgetting what we know, um, it would be easier to solve some problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so what are the challenges in your work along the way? I'll reflect on that. Um, well, I think one that's really hard is not knowing if the problem is actually solvable. Um, so when you work on, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have this problem with the things they work on like it may there may not be a solution it may not be what we're thinking about but I think it is a solvable problem so and I think you really have to believe it's solvable in order to solve it so usually again that goes back to the <laughs> existential hope and eternal optimism mm -hmm. but I think um but I think what I've noticed actually is a lot of people in my field I feel like think the problem is not solvable and that's why they're asking it the way they are and if you thought it was solvable you would ask it a different way um, so a lot of the limitation of that, I think, comes from where you, you see the, the problem and the solution space and how you actually look at it. Um, so, but that, that's a big challenge. And so then it becomes a challenge of trying to, because you're trying to change the narrative so much, how do you get people that have been in this field for decades to shift their mindset? And you really just don't, you just have to kind of work around them and build something else that's in a different space. And so most of my career, what I've done is just work in spaces where nobody else is working so there's less competition and also there's more freedom for actually working on real problems and trying to come up with real solutions. Right. Um, is there any question from our audience? So as a, as a practical matter, what are you thinking for how to do these experiments? Oh, um, that's a good Lee question. <laughs> right. You want to answer the question, how to do experiments? Can I start trying to these questions out? I'm sorry. No, we've got... Um, so the, the short answer to that is we've got some prototype experiments going on right now, and um, they are milliuri life experiments. So the milliuri experiment, gas discharge, um, spark discharge in the gas, recirculating stuff, and then also we've got um, a whole bunch of reactors where you've got putting simple chemicals, amino acids, whatnot, over different surfaces and moving them around. And Abhishek is partly designing these with he's actually the team leader of the and the droplets. Team. And the droplet, and we're actually so there's two things: is doing making a droplet-based life form, so actually salad dressing and evolving the salad dressing, and making a chemical-based life form and evolving those, and literally evolving them in the physical world. So the idea is put some chemistry in the pot, mix it, heat it, then look at what comes out, recirculate, keep going until anything comes out. It sounds like the the experiment sounds so simple, but like the idea, like with the droplets, that I think is like super profound is this idea that you want to evolve in the oil droplet, some kind of internal representation or history. So it actually stores its own history and actually can ha exhibit goal-directed behavior based on that history. And that's the kind of thing that, that Lee and Abhishek are doing. You, Abhishek, you look like you want to say something. No, that's, 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 how, how did people do this before? They, they did, didn't. They didn't. They did, what they did before they had their pet, pe I mean, you're a chemist, right? I think, right? Uh, a lot of, you probably know, like a lot of origin life chemists, they just do middle year experiments. So, try and do basic chemistry now there's a lot of people just trying to take the molecule they think is the solution to the problem 
and reverse engineering it, be it RNA, try and make RNA the simplest way. Because the problem is there's this prize called the Nobel Prize, and it seems like senior chemists who get a bit bored think that they're going to win the Nobel Prize at some point if they solve Origin of Life. So they try and look at their thesis. So there's a bunch of very old... Well, well I think I think this is also actually historically a very big problem in the Origin of Life field because people thought it was so hard and they couldn't solve it. Most of the people that work in the field were people that made their name doing something else and they started working in it when they were older. And now yeah. it's changing quite a bit. There's a lot more early career people starting at like, you know, at grad level working on origins of life and actually being able to state that, but that wasn't always historically the case. I, mean, we're the, I think we were the first to go out and actually say we're going to try and make it. I still kept, keep getting criticized. I gave a TED talk at Tech Global in 2011, where Chris Anderson said at the end, how long is it going to take you to do it? I said, oh, a couple of years. And I meant a couple of years after Abhishek fixes all the hardware mm -hmm. and Sarah comes up with a theory, I'll just go and press the go button. But it, often people say, you haven't solved it yet. It's like, well, yeah, but I, I I think the 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 language of even solving the origin of life. I I was interviewed by somebody recently, and she's like, "No one ever says that. It's so weird that you say that." And I'm like, "Yes, I know. This is the thing because like because people have because actually even historically, like the issue of defining life, right, was like is has been this huge contentious debate in astrobiology. Like, how do you come up with a definition of life, and then do you use that to inform your origin life experiment? And no one can agree on the definition of life. And so what most people do in origins of life research is they assume a definition, be it life is a metabolic system or life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And then they build molecular parts of that under very controlled conditions where they say, I want to get this molecule that life on earth uses. So let me change this pH and add this UV here. And then they get the product that they wanted. And what you want to do for an origin life experiment, if you really want to see a spontaneous de novo origin of life event is you want to have a chemical system that's as unconstrained as possible and you subject it to like different environmental conditions and you see life evolve you know spontaneously without designing it in you also, you can't put design in an experiment that's looking for the emergence of systems that are you know like evidence of evolutionary design right if you put design in you're not going to see that so the, there's this like assumption people have that like it's this really this is actually where it departs from like the standard physics because actually standard physics includes design and the laws of physics the way we talk about it and you want a universe with no design laws you want the universe to design the things that emerge and that's what evolution does but we don't know how to do that in an experiment yet and then the other thing there's an experiment you put in a lot you have to learn how to become geochemists i'm not a geochemist i'm an inorganic chemist um, i am yeah yeah and so I'm, mentioning, <laughs> I'm mentioning it right yeah. just getting more information from down in the earth yeah. High pressure, high temperature, different minerals, different materials. The problem is a lot of the earth is li li a lot of the minerals are ba produced by life. Yeah. What we could do is go all the way back to a planet, a pristine planet, where there's minimal inorganic chemistry, minimal min because life. I don't think it just emerged in cells; it emerged geochemically on the planet. So I, I thought we had some notion that you can kind of carbon, hydrogen, water, some of this kind of stuff, and you start getting into uh, oils and start getting liquid hydrocarbons and gas hydrocarbons and water and then something happens with my cells and that's maybe, the big yeah. jump maybe well you yeah but you get you get you get self-assembly of like cell-like structures all the time under these kind of periodic conditions but they totally. they don't they, then the problem becomes how do you get a replicate like a, right. a molecule inside of it that's coupled to the replication and people can do that if they like tightly engineer it so like jack Shostak's lab has demonstrated that but i mean those are those are heavily designed engineered systems they're not things that you spontaneously see emerging out of those in, kind of in the end what we want is a massive we want three massive engines we want a earth engine like just a uh, earth in a pot, right from the core to the surface, right? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. We need a computational engine, yep. right, to simulate, and we need the theory engine, yep. right? So they, and they have to go together. We're trying to build fragments of them all. We're a bit, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. So you just need like a lot of different pore spaces? A lot of different pore spaces. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, if you can do, like, you can do all sorts of reactions in clays, right? You can yeah. do lots of reactions in, there's so, so much you can do, um, but it's just, we're just applying our theory to minerals and working at how assembly theory, molecular theory works with minerals and materials. Oh, cool. And, and that's taking some time. We're getting there. It all mm -hmm. takes time. Yeah. yeah. How do you put energy into these sorts of systems? Because, you know, life <laughs> needs energy. To Everything needs play. energy. Well, no, absolutely. Super <laughs> <way. laughs> Just, yeah, you can heat it. You can put in microwaves. You can put in, uh, you can put in EMF. Um, so you get yeah, there's lots of ways putting energy. The other thing is to make sure you take out carrot and the waste. Yeah. So the, the reason why I built the 
the, the, the computer and the actual the programming, the chemistry was actually for this. It was basically to have a big like lambda calculus. You know, you have the Y combinator in lambda calculus for copying the, mm -hmm. the, the, the that's the most minimal compu uh, computer science way of making a replicator, right? So I, I like the oil drop it with the fueling station idea. Yeah, Did yeah, you build that don't, one? Don't, that's, it's, it's secret. Oh, okay. it there. Yeah. The injectors have been done. We've got the we've got the uh, if we can. I can just imagine this ridiculous experiment where Abhishek chasing an oil drop at ground in a dish with some fuel trying to stab it. But maybe we can do that. But to answer the question, not only do you have to put in energy and material, you have to get, make, get rid of waste, but you also have to get rid of, you want to make sure the waste doesn't have any like replicators in it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you've got to really be very careful about, and that's where the standard recursive experiment is this. You put a load of simple chemicals in a pot, with some minerals, heat the hell out of it, right? And then at the end of the reaction, stop, throw away everything except a very small amount of template, restart the same reaction again, but with a little bit of the past in the future as a template. Uh, this was uh, really interesting, this like three part thing that you said about uh, earth engine, computation and theory. Is there any write up or anything about those things? And like, that would be really interesting. <laughs> We're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming together. There's one, there's that book chapter we've just done, mm -hmm. which I can give you a copy of. Okay. Because I've been interested in uh, like minimum uh, description like uh, stuff, and that that is a bit similar to the like uh, theory part of it. Mm -hmm. um, this Earth engine, uh, like not to be discouraging, but it seems like a huge situation. Like to, because like uh, I'm I'm learning more about your uh, computer stuff, and it's like um, you would basically try to like like un like how large scale would you have to be in order to be able to uh, replicate enough of the geo thermal or geo whatever uh, situation of the Earth to conclusively say like something about life or something. For Sarah, she's doing work on calculating that issue right now. Yeah, I don't, I mean, we don't have an estimate of the size experiment, but the sort of like vision that we're trying to build is you would, you would have to build a very large scale experiment that could do enough volume of chemical space to see a Genovo alien origin event. And we actually don't know how large You're calculating the molecular, the, the mechanism, well, you're calculating what um, molecular, alien molecules look like on Enceladus, right? And you're yeah, yeah, yeah. That, no, so, so I, I actually, this goes into the part about like the title of this session about how different alien life will be. And we do, we, like, with this theory that we've been developing, it is possible to take the geochemistry of a planet and predict some like high level features of the chemistry that might emerge if it emerges into biology to say statistically, like how different would biochemistry be on different planets? And this is also a big conceptual shift because right now in astrobiology, everyone is looking on other planets for molecules that life on earth produced. But our argument is life on Earth is a product of Earth. Um, and um, most evolutionary innovations you find on Earth, you will find nowhere else in the universe, right? They're very unique to Earth. And that starts at the chemical level. And you might actually even be able to predict at what scale of chemistry we should start to see evolutionary divergence. We're writing a paper just now, which is going to act as a big hand grenade for the RNA world, which is say why RNA is absolutely unique to Earth. Just like, so <laughs> just like TikTok. Just like TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I like your TikTok yeah. example. Yeah. yeah but, but why, Sorry. Why, so we're, yeah. Why, why should it, what do I just, like, I understand if I no, so it's just, it's, it's sulfur on a planet and it's in with carbon. I right, but, but think, yeah, so, so, but people, yeah, so it'll probably be carbon based, right? But people really underappreciate how large chemical space is. I mean, so, uh, like, really underappreciate how large chemical space is. So, um, if, if you if you look at like I think it's it, I, I and Abhishek and Lee maybe know better than I do, but like it, like in chem informatics literature, it's like estimate of like ten to the sixty molecules that are like less than six hundred amu. It's just like more 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 resources than are available in the entire universe to make one of each of those molecules, right? So the chemical space is like is so large that if you're thinking about building up complex macromolecules. If there's like a symmetry breaking early in the process of like the small molecules you form and the kind of bonds you form, there could be a very large divergence when you get to large molecules. And that's sort of part of the argument. So everything's evolutionary contingent on the steps that went before. So if in small molecule space, you already have this huge diversity of possible paths, then when you get to large molecule space, it, it just could be radically different. It's what like an extreme would ask is like, would you get, uh, eat the aliens and have sex with them? Like, no, you can't have sex with them. You can't eat. You could try and have sex with them, but it's not going to be productive and you won't be able to eat them. So what it means is like saying, the information in RNA. So, so I got the part where once you start to get into larger molecules, mm -hmm. you have a bunch of carbon rings and a bunch of other stuff going on. Yeah. Then where the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, all this stuff is gets different. 
I mean, some people would eat it. There's a simple sugar at the bottom of this. Or simple alcohol. And that might be, right? I just yeah. know, it's an interesting question. All I'm saying is, I think it's... Aren't, aren't all of our RNA, DNA, proteins, et cetera, et cetera, at the end, isn't there glucose, lactose, like a handful of... There's ribose, sugars? right? And the, rib and the deoxyribose. So you have to think... So sure, there's sugar in there, but we don't know what form that's going to be. And sure, on Earth... Right, and even if you go to amino acids, I mean, when people do estimates of like the size of amino acid space, it's already huge. It's already huge. Just in, yeah. in amino acids. It's like you just, or just it's, sugers. I mean, it's just a, it's a combinatorial space. So every every time space. you add a bond, right. you're combinatorially right. exploding I mean, the space. So, so if, you, if you yeah. get a coin, you flick a coin, heads and tails, yeah, two times in a row, you're like, cool. You keep getting heads. Like, how many times do you get heads before you know I've ripped the coin? 10 times? Probably. You get to 10 times, there's absolutely no chance that you're going to get 10 heads in a row. Well, you've been flicking that coin for a really long time. So you have to ask the same thing in chemical space for chemical react with kinetic rates. Like, what rate do you get to this molecule to get to this moiety? Mm -hmm. So how much information is put into RNA? It's a small molecule, but it's pure. Chemists just can't get right. their head out of their asses. And the just... amount of stuff that has to be one to one true to cleave the bond to eat yeah. it. Yeah, it's exactly. so much specificity. And right. the thing is, like, like people think the size of the physical universe and like coordinate geometry is large. The size of like the universe of things that could be built on this planet is like exponentially larger if you could compare yeah. co combinatorial space to a coordinate space. So, and I think like we don't think of this space as a physical space. But in order to solve the problem of life, you have to think about it as a physical space and you have to give it structure. And so that's the, the theory that we're developing called assembly theory gives structure to the space of what can be built combinatorially. And then the idea is how do you know that you had selection in that space and what kinds of sets of objects could you get in that space? And that basically defines the path of life through the space of things that could be built. And that's that's the essentially the physics. It's a huge space. <laughs> Once you appreciate that. Yeah. The, the oil guys get into this. Oil is a soup with 10,000 compounds. Yeah. And they've got trillions of dollars on well, how did it get to you? Yeah, that yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have two other questions yeah. here. Yeah, Kelvin, please. And then. Yeah, just quickly two questions. Uh, one, what, is, what are the ideological blinders you think that is preventing people in the field from seeing mm -hmm. having the same worldview as you do? Yeah. And then secondly, you said earlier that uh, there's more like young people getting into the space now, but also people in the space have a that the problem is unsolvable. So yes. Why, why are more people coming into here? Um, so I think I think the the answer to the first question about why people haven't solved the problem is a lot of people think it's unsolvable, and also just people are trained to think a certain way about a certain problem, um, and then they keep hammering it even though it hasn't been working, <laughs> rather than finding like a new way of doing it. And what I think that's it? just a, a product of human nature. And then. Um, uh, with the young people, I think I think there is some transition that people are hoping that it might be solvable. There's money going in, but the, the, yeah. the, just to answer your question, just to add on is the one important thing that people don't have that we're maybe it's competition. No one agrees what success looks like. Yes. If you don't know what success looks like, like say fusion, right? We've got to basically help sustain self-sustaining fusion reaction. Right? That's what that's hard, but we can know what to look for. Getting into orbit, no. So, yeah, there's no met, there's no metric for we, success. We think we've got a metric for life, mm -hmm. right? We should. Um, it's the start. It's not the end. I would like to, you know, at the end of, of this metric, wouldn't it be great if we go in the lab, your, you know, the theory, the simulation, and we basically design a new cell or evolve a new cell, and there's a cell coming out, and you have two cells. You have an Earth cell, an E. coli, and you just feed it Earth food, and it multiplies and does stuff. And you have the alien cell. And you fight, you fight, you you feed it alien food, and it and it remultiplies. And if you then look at the molecular machinery, it's different. If we're able to do that, mm -hmm. then I think I deserve Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> but then, wouldn't your experiment preclude that though? Because you're throwing away everything in between. No, which we're not throwing away everything. We're keeping some calories. So that's the chemical basis. So that's why we've got this droplet robot. So the idea is to have a soup robot generates loads of soup, and in the end, I connect the soup robot to the droplet robot. We're only just. I've been trying to do this for 10 years, right? And we're only just ready-ish, right? Maybe this year, then no, next year, just ready now. I mean, the amount of technology, yeah. like, it cost me $30 million to get where we've got. So and, it's, and it's also a matter of, like, coupling the theory to calculate how much information you put into the experiments, you know, how much yeah. you generated de novo out of it. And that part's also really conceptually hard. There's no standards. Yeah. Right. So the other thing that we're working on is like, what would the standards for an origin life experiment be? How do you say I put this much information in and I got these complex molecules out and say it wasn't my experimental setup that produced the complexity. It was the experiment. The chemistry did it. 
So, and we have ways of, of thinking about that problem that, and that hasn't even been asked before. But that, but the, that's important because it gives you a way to compare like genetics first versus metabolism first experiments. So with like, so every origin life experiment ever done cannot be cross compared right now. There's no way of unifying them and under any kind of conceptual framework. So that's actually also a key shift is just being able to use people's data together. We have a question here. Yes. Um, so if, in case there's an observation outside to, to, to this, how would you design um, experiments differently based on your framework, either in situ for the solar system or... Oh, so uh, you mean like when we go actually fly missions? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so Lee, Lee and I are working actually on an Enceladus mission right now, um, which would, would fly, or there's an idea to fly this molecular assembly measure to like measure in the plume of Enceladus if there were complex molecules that might be only produced by life. And we have a, a one of my PhD students has been visiting Lee's lab to basically map out what would be the instrumentation requirements for a NASA mission to be able to do this kind of detection. Um, on the exoplanet side, I've worked on exoplanets for a number of years. And for a while, I was doing some stuff with like trying to think about atmospheric networks and like what's the structure of a network like if you think about life as a, a planetary scale system what would be the signatures and sort of the patterns of chemistry you see in the atmosphere um and that has a lot of problems mostly because exoplanet science is like a, a cookbook of taking random reactions and sticking them together and hoping they'd work that way in a planetary atmosphere when they've been done mostly in industrial settings to know the reaction rates and things and under you know completely different conditions that might exist on like Jupiter or, or on a, like a Neptune like world or wherever these things are being applied. So long story short, um, I don't think that we can use atmospheric models for this kind of work, but we're trying to go back um, like to first principles with this assembly stuff and try to figure out how would you construct features of the spectrum of an atmosphere and, and be able to detect it. And we have some data on detecting things in infrared. I think that is exciting. Yeah, that, I, I <laughs> but actually, building a telescope based on that, on that will be hard. <laughs> but, the, but the problem with exoplanets is nobody knows how to do life, life detection for exoplanets. And mo most of that field is very, um, like the detection limits are really hard. And then any molecular biosignature that you can detect remotely has false positives. And we don't know enough constraints on the mo planetary models to rule them out. It sounds like it's an open problem in the first place and a very open problem in the second Yes. Case. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Last, uh, yeah. Last yeah, question. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, this sure. is something about uh, cells storing their own history and then like uh, something about goal-directed behavior and evolving mm -hmm. so on. Can you like, talk a bit more about the, the goal-directed aspect and also like the history stuff? Yeah, so so the con uh, conjecture, like this is my favorite conceptual thought experiment right now, is just that like the suggestion of this theory you're developing is that all complex matter actually has a physical size and time. So um, yeah, they have a, physical... a physical size and time. So, um, you know, it, t it took the planet 3.8 billion years to make you. Uh, that's probably not like your size and time, but it just indicates that you're a lineage that goes back, like parts of you are 3.8 billion years old, right? So, um, so if you actually think about that as a physical attribute, then objects are their histories. Um, and when you account for that feature of the structure, goal-directed behavior becomes sort of a facet of how, how large are the histories of an object. And that sets some boundary on what the future goals of that object can be and future goal states. And we have, we have ways of formalizing that. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, one last quick follow up. Uh, how heavily are you involving mathematicians? You mentioned that you want to like, do math and stuff, but like, it feels like super juicy problems for like... Yeah, well, why do I have to give my math problems to other math people? Why don't I want to yeah, do it sure. myself? Of course, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are talking to other mathematicians, they're coming out. All right. I, well, I think I think um, one challenge, which we talked about at lunch, actually, uh, with developing new theories is you can't put the, the cart before the horse, which means you can't put the math before the ideas. Mm -hmm. And so because we're working so much on conceptual foundations, if you uh, like if you bring in somebody with like the mathematical skills too early, it can over constrain the abstractions you're trying to build in the wrong possible way because people just run off with like what the math is telling you. And so it's. So right now, what we're really trying to do is get the fundamentals and the principles right and be sure that we can map those concepts to experiments. And then, of course, it would be wonderful to have people that actually can formalize this and make these things well, right Math isn't that hard. I mean, the ridiculous thing of math isn't that hard. No, it's actually... I would think that it's like super large scale. There are many problems that people have to work on. That's, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. We did do a Cadbury theory based semi-theory at the beginning, which ended up proving that one, one equals one. 
better than one equals zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there is, there is, a, a, there is a paper in the archive written with some theory written in category theory, if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it's a. Uh... Oh wow! Yay! Hi. Hi. Hey, everybody. Okay, uh, so thank you so much. Sure, thank you.